every city has its ghosts. Whether you live in an ancient town filled with ruins from another era, or you wander streets built within your own lifetime, you cannot escape the whispers of the dead, filling the cracks in the pavement and the spaces between the walls. For Katie and Tiffany, who live on opposite sides of the world, this has become very apparent. When you hear their stories, you might begin to wonder what's lurking in your favorite restaurant, on your favorite bridge, or in your own backyard. Settle in for some spooky stories, today on Homespun Haints. Hello, Hainted Loves. Welcome to Homespun Haints. I'm Becky. And I'm Diana. <laughs> she thinks she's Diana. Buonasera, I sono Diana. Ah, there you go. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> I am so thrilled today, Diana, that we have two more podcasters on the show today. This is going to be another show where we have two guests. Yay! Katie and Tiffany of the Bittersweet Life podcast. They have been doing this podcast for a very, very long time. And it started when they both lived in Rome. And Tiffany still lives in Rome, which, oh my God, how cool is that? However, they were childhood friends from school in Seattle, Washington. They just happened to both move to Rome. The world is a small place, is it not? It is. And they reconnected and they formed this podcast. And they talk about all sorts of wonderful things. They have some very famous guests on the podcast, including Diana and Becky of Homespun Hands. Mm-hmm. Yes, you may have heard us on their episode last week. So if that's how you found out about us. Thank you so much. We're so excited that you're here with us Welcome. today. Welcome. Tiffany and Katie are going to share with us several stories. And what's interesting about this interview is we started out hearing about some Roman folklore, ghost stories, that Tiffany relates to us. And as these two wonderful guests began to delve more and more into their stories, they realized they too have personal ghost stories. Yes. And when they said, I don't know if this story is big enough to qualify. They were like, oh, yes. (laughs) Remember Diana's basement ghost and how many small little things weren't big enough to qualify as a full story until 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 you're undeniably face to face with a ghost face to foot Fa- oh, wait, with you a f- a foot <laughs> foot to foot foot to foot i went toe to toe with a ghost to toe, yes but our guess it's other body parts <laughs> <laughs> You'll just have to wait and listen, folks. So we're very excited today to have Katie and Tiffany on the show. And also, big thank you to Katie. She's also one of our patrons. Thank you, Katie. Which is awesome. Yeah. We love you. We love you both so much. We're just so excited to air the show. We record these episodes in advance, and Diana is about to leave Atlanta and head back to Tulsa. By the time this episode airs, Diana will be back. Long gone. In her Midwestern haunted house. Rather than yours. <laughs> yeah. Well, mine's a Southern haunted house. It's a little different. A little different. So, Touché. Diana, one thing I promised that I was going to make you do while you were still here. Was a corn maze. A corn maze. It and, was a threat, not a promise. And yes, we did indeed. I took Diana kicking and screaming. <laughs> she dragged me by the ear. Get it? That's a corn joke. <laughs> but a bump. We went to a corn maze and... And I didn't have to solve it or get lost because Becky's kids solved it for me. We were like, where are the children? And they're like, we're at the exit. Yeah, they just like pummeled right through. And then we went through again trying to get lost. Yeah, we were like, what if we explore other pathways? pathways. Are we going to get inextricably lost in the corn maze? And nope, the kids found their way out in 25 seconds. And then on the way through, we met a family that was so lost (laughs) that they were about to turn around and give up and try and retrace their steps. (laughs) So we don't know. Maybe it was... Just a haunted corn maze that was only spooky and treacherous for some people. So first experience in a corn maze. Thank you, Becky, for forcing me to do a corn maze with your children. Thank goodness the kids were there because they showed me the way, the truth, and the light through the corn. They did not become children of the corn. They were very much anxious to get out of the corn. And then when we were like, oh, let's look at the cute horses, they were like, nah. (laughs) <laughs> We've seen plenty of horses. We live in Georgia. You and Amber, though, and went over and pet the pigs, right? Oh, they are so cute pigs, and one of them was chewing on a pumpkin. <laughs> 
<laughs> so cute. We'll post that cute gnoming pig on on TikTok. So if you don't already follow us on TikTok, go to TikTok.com. We're at Homespun Haints and you can watch a cute pig eating a cute pumpkin. So yeah, we would like to give a huge shout out to Sleepy Hollow Farms. It's a Christmas tree farm up in Powder Springs, Georgia, off of Sleepy Hollow Road. This is where we had the corn maze. Diana saw the cute pumpkin. And also, we did a murder mystery haunted corn maze. Oh, that was fun, too. It was escape woods, and they have different things. And one of them is in the corn maze. They have a little section, and it's a murder mystery that we had to solve late at night. We only had our flashlights, and we weren't allowed to use our phones. It was supposed to be 1990s. We had to like find a tape recorder and things like that to, to solve the mystery. But what was so interesting about this? Like, granted, it was awesome. Diana, I hope you're realizing one of the reasons I love Georgia so much. When we first arrived, there were four of us. And by the time we left, there were only two. (laughs) No, Sorry, what are you getting at? Our host said, well, I have three flashlights. Who wants them? And I said, though, that's okay. I have my own ghost hunting flashlight in my purse, which actually didn't work. It worked the next night. I was ready to throw it away. (gasps) Really? It worked the next night, but not the night that we needed it? Not that night. Yeah. Mm. And as soon as I said that, oh, the story started. (laughs) So when we were done with solving, and we got two out of three, which wasn't bad. We did pretty good. It was was my first escape room. Yeah, mine too. Yeah. So not too bad. Not not too too bad. bad. We had no idea what to expect. It was great. There were actors and everything. It was really, really good. But as we're getting ready to go, the hosts, the the actors, the people running it started telling their own ghost stories. Mm -hmm. And they had so many. So apparently the farm is haunted. Truly. Truly haunted. They have ghosts. They have a ghost cat. And they might have a demon. They think they have a demon that only follows people with a certain name. (laughs) And they all just had stories. They just started coming out. And then one person was like, oh, yeah, I live next to a Civil War battleground. I see Civil War soldiers all the time marching through my backyard. Like, this is completely matter of fact. You're right. The South is better. I know. Well, you were also like, everybody's so into Halloween here. Yeah. Well, the decorations, I mean, it was a long, winding drive through Marietta to this place. And all the Halloween decorations we got to see on the way were unreal. They are amazing. The spooky South. It was so cool. But yeah, just hearing all these stories that started to come out. They told us so many stories that the next group showed up and the actors had to like bolt and dart out <laughs> so they wouldn't be seen. It was truly a good time. So if you are with Sleepy Hollow Farms, thank you. If you're with the Escape Woods, thank you so much for sharing your stories. Come on the show. Tell us your stories. We want to hear about the demon. Yes. Well, going to the other side of the world now, (laughs) we do have a Rome in Georgia, but this is not the same Rome. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. No, we're going to go to Rome, Italy, and we're going to hear from Tiffany telling us some Roman folk tales. And then we're going to hear from Katie and hear some stories in Seattle. And as we mentioned, Katie is part of our Patreon. If you too would like to hear these episodes without ads and get additional bonus content delivered into your ear holes every week, please go check us out at patreon.com slash homespun hates. And if you're not a member of our Patreon, enjoy this commercial. Today on the show, we have Katie and Tiffany of the Bittersweet Life podcast. They are two podcasters who record from very different locations. I think there's a nine hour difference between you two. Is that true, Katie and Tiffany? Yes. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Wow. I don't know how you do it, but that's amazing. Kudos to you. So tell us a little bit about your podcast. Yeah, so Tiffany is in Rome, and I'm in Seattle. So that's why the major difference in our time zones. Our podcast is a very old podcast. It's been around for almost 10 years now. It started out when Tiffany and I were both living in Rome at the same time. I was a brand new expat who was only there for one year. I was just on a temporary contract. And Tiffany was there already for almost 10 years. So originally it was us living on the same block, exploring Rome, 
looking at the living abroad experience from the newbie, wide-eyed, making tons of mistakes versus the real expert. And let's not forget that we were childhood friends as well. Yes, that's true. We'd met on the school bus in the sixth grade. That's cool. We did not meet just in Rome. But then over time, of course, the show has expanded because I moved home. And so now it's more of an exploration of what do we want to be doing with our lives or anyone's life? Like, how do you decide what you want to do? And, and also about how those choices that you make can affect you for both good and for bad. Oh, that's poignant. I love it. Did you both go to Rome with the intention of being there together? Or was this kind of a strange reconnection you weren't expecting? It was a happy coincidence. I chose to move to Rome many, many years ago, and I lived there, and Katie and I, we just didn't see each other very often because of how far apart we lived, and we didn't keep in touch as much as we probably would have liked to. And then she, I don't know if you called me or emailed me out of the blue and said, guess what? I'm moving to Rome for a year. And <laughs> it was like every expat's dream. Because when you move far away like that, you don't have the luxury of being friends with people you've known your whole life. Everyone you know, you've known since you've been there, pretty much. And so it was very, very exciting for me. I've become more bold, but I was not the boldest mover. Just like, oh, sure, what the heck? I'll just move to Rome for a year. I think I had the courage to do it in part because Tiffany was there. Yeah, I can totally identify with that. I would move to Rome if Becky was there. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Gosh. Without hesitation. But why by are, myself, why? Why aren't we there? <laughs> right? Why aren't we? Why do aren't you we? have like an extra bedroom? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm in it right now. We turned it into a studio. I love Rome. It is such a beautiful city. It truly is. You can never get bored there. Yeah, it's amazing. There are a million reasons why to move to Rome, but it's still, you know, it's like many things in life. It throws you out of your comfort zone. Tiffany, let's start with you. You have some Roman ghost stories that you would like to share with us. Yes, there are several ghost stories connected with the city of Rome, but there are a couple of particular ones that are intriguing. My personal favorite is the ghost story of Beatrice Cenci. She was the most fascinating character. It's a ghastly story, even leading up to her death. But the time when she was alive is also terrifying. She was a noblewoman of the noble Chenchi family, and she was very young. She was only maybe in her late teens. Her father was abusing her and her stepmother and one of her younger brothers and abusing them physically, abusing them sexually. Horrible, horrible situation. And everyone in the city knew about it. The whole city knew about it. Their screams could be heard down the street. It was, it was just a really horrible situation. He eventually moved them out into the countryside and locked them into a tower in their country home. It's like a grisly fairy tale. Finally, Beatrice and her stepmother and apparently her lover, the guard of the tower was her lover they decided to plot together to murder her father. They were not very smart about it. They hit him over the head with something and killed him, but realizing too late that it was gonna be a little bit obvious, they decided to throw him off the balcony and that would make everybody think that it had been an accident. But the police apparently were a little bit too smart and they realized something about how the balcony was situated. They realized that he did not just accidentally fall off the balcony, but that he was pushed. And so Beatrice, her stepmother and her brothers, they were all arrested. At that time, because the Pope ruled in that area, not just as a religious leader, but as a political leader, if you were arrested, if you were arrested and condemned and probably either imprisoned or executed, all of your worldly goods had to be turned over to the Pope. That family was extremely wealthy and they had lots of property. And so even though the people of the city did not want to see this family executed because everyone knew and felt that it was completely justified what they had done, the Pope decided to have them executed because he wanted their money. They were all executed in front of Castel Sant'Angelo on September 11th, 1599. Beatrice was beheaded, her stepmother was beheaded, and her brothers were drawn and quartered. 
so eviscerated and had their hearts beating pulled out of their bodies. To get to the ghost part of this story, if I haven't horrified you enough already, the story goes that every night between the night of September 10th and September 11th, Beatrice Cenci, this young, beautiful girl who was only 21 when she was executed, can be seen walking down the bridge in front of where she was executed, cradling her own head. Oh, I love that. (laughs) (laughs) Cradling her head like a baby or just like she needs to carry it somehow? I guess that was the easiest way to hold it. What's the name of the bridge that she can be seen on? It's the Ponte Sant'Angelo. It's in the city. It's right in front of Castel Sant'Angelo, which is a medieval fortress. And it was in front of that bridge that executions often took place. And her execution took place there. I should mention that fortress is probably the biggest structure next to where the Vatican is. So if you go and see the Vatican, you're, you're very close to where you might encounter this ghost. So what, does she tend to appear, you said it was September 10th through September 11th. Is it at night or is it just during that entire span? Just in the night between those two days. So now you know when to go to Rome next, you two. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is a grisly story. I love it. That I, was cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anytime you have a headless ghost cradling their own head. They can be part of the Headless Ghost Club. And was it Harry Potter where there was the Headless Ghost Club? Oh, the Headless Hunt. The Headless Hunt. Yeah. Yeah. So she would would qualify. Yes. So does this story sort of kind of folklorically cross over with La Bella Umbriana? La what? Is this something I should know about? It's something you definitely need to know about. La Bella Umbriana? Yeah, we had a, an Italian-American guest who told us the story about the Italian house spirit who is actually the ghost of a princess who comes to your house and either leaves you fortune if your house is nice and clean and has fresh air in it or kills people if she oh, finds dear. any trouble with people in your house. Wow, sounds like a lot of Italian mother-in-laws. Yeah, yeah you want to keep your house clean. I've actually never heard of that story. I've never heard of that character. But Beatrice Cenci is absolutely 100% a historical figure. Yes, there's the story of her ghost, which who knows how many people have actually seen this ghost. I've never personally seen it, although I would be very excited to. But she existed. Everything is very well documented. That makes sense. It wasn't that long ago. And there would have been pretty detailed records, I'm assuming, of executions and papal decrees and all that. Yes, and it was actually a very high-profile execution that everyone was talking about. I know this is not the only ghost story that you have to share with us. You have some more you'd like to tell us about with Roman folklore? The other one has to do with Olympia Maidalkini, another historical figure. She was the sister-in-law of a pope. And in fact, she was so important to him and she was so influential over him that he would not make any decisions without consulting her. And in fact, when he was elected, his fellow cardinals turned to each other and said, we've just elected the first female pope because they knew that whatever this pope decided, she would be the person behind it. So the pope in question is Pope Innocent X of the Pomfili family. She was married to his brother, very powerful, very much of a grand dame, almost to the extreme, but she was also very money hungry. It was kind of a traditional thing that when a pope died, anybody in the city could ransack his palace and take away whatever he or she could carry. Yeah, it was very, very common. It was kind of like if Italy wins the World Cup, everybody can go in the fountains. Otherwise, it's like a €5,000 fine to go in one of Rome's fountains. But if Italy wins the World Cup, everybody does it. It's the same sort of thing. So when the Pope dies, it is known. It is going to happen. Everyone in the city is going to ransack his palace and steal whatever, whatever they can get. She saw that he was dying. And here's a man who has been completely devoted to her his entire life. And all of her power comes through him. And she realizes that he's going to die. So she cuts and runs. Like basically, she fills up chests with all of the gold. And it's not really his personal money. It's like church money. She fills chests up with gold and puts them in her carriage and takes off. The palace is in Piazza Navona, right in the center of the city where anybody is going to be able to just waltz right in. And so she decides to go up to their 
quote unquote country house, their suburban house, which is up on a hill south of the city. And she takes off in the middle of the night on January 7th. January 7th is the date that if you go to the Ponte Sisto, another bridge, but a bridge going in the other direction up to where they had their country home, apparently you can sometimes see her carriage racing across the bridge. Now, did she get caught during this and killed? Is that why her carriage still races across the bridge? No, actually, she seems to have gotten away with it, but she didn't get off scot-free because the plague caught up with her. Two years later, she dies of the bubonic plague. Yeah, that sounds kind of (laughs) karmic. Speculation, why do you think her carriage is still seen, this haunting? Why do you think this legend has sprung up or if people have actually seen this ghost? It seems like kind of an odd thing to have a haunting for, especially if nothing bad happened to her during it. That's a good question. I'm not really a ghost expert. Maybe because somebody saw her once on that same night, January 7th, that they just made the connection. I I couldn't really tell you. Don't you two talk about when there's like an echo of an event that replays over and over and over again? Yeah. So maybe you know. It's called a residual haunting, and there's a lot of theories about what could cause it. Some people have talked about it being like a time loop, maybe a tear in the fabric of time. It's not really a haunting. It's just you're seeing that sort of replay. Usually when it happens, the quote-unquote ghost isn't really aware that they're doing it or they don't interact with the living or the environment. They just go on a predefined loop. But also a lot of people believe it has to do with the minerals in the soil and or the body of water that the bridge is crossing over, Mm -hmm. providing almost like a, a tape recording. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of theories that water, especially moving bodies of water like rivers, are conduits for paranormal activity. And also bridges tend to be haunted because they are considered liminal spaces. They're spaces in between, right? You're not really on land. You're not really on water. And ghosts like those liminal spaces because they themselves exist between. That is, you just blew my mind right now. Because both of those stories are about bridges. And now I'm like, oh my gosh, it all makes sense. Exactly. I would not be surprised if there's some other stories about bridges throughout Rome as well, as you uncover more stories. Now, would it help? Because the Tiber River, I don't even know if one could count or even estimate how many dead bodies have been thrown into that river and gone downstream. Oh, God. Yeah, there's that too. (laughs) So many. So many was like the prime dumping ground for anyone you wanted to get rid of. And lots of suicides as well. There's an amazing church at one bend, I guess, or one crossing of the river. Its entire mission at a time was to fish out bodies where they would get caught along this one spot and provide burials for them. And they have a little slot in the side of the wall with a skeleton hanging over the slot. And the slot, do you remember what the slot itself says? Are you talking about Santa Maria dell'Orazione Morte? Is that the one you mean on Via Giulia, at the beginning of Via Giulia, the one that's always closed? Yes. Always closed and covered in skulls. It's called St. Mary of the Oration and Death. And it's got two sculpted skulls on the top of the doorway. And then it has two etchings of skeletons, etchings into marble on the front of the church. And the little plaque, I would love to be able to like pull it out in Latin and impress you guys. But I can't remember exactly what the Latin is. But the translation is, me today, you tomorrow. Oh, I love that. How old is this church? Oh, it's like five or 600 years old. And there's tons of skulls inside, like human skulls. Because by having collected all these bodies, they got a lot of body parts hanging around. They have a little cabinet just full of just skulls lined up. But that's nothing compared to the crypt of the Capuchin monks. Have you guys heard of that one? Yeah, I think I've been in it. It's the one where they decorate like four or five rooms, not just with bones, but they build the bones into chandeliers and like dioramas. And that also starts with the equally ominous plaque that says, what you are, we once were, what we are, you one day will be, I believe is what it says. And there's one other really amazing spooky site in Rome that should be maybe mentioned in this episode, and that is the Museum of the Souls in Purgatory. Because this museum basically has what they consider proof of purgatory. 
they have like prayer books that like hand prints appeared on of people in purgatory, I guess trying to trying to get through or trying to pay for their sins and get on to heaven. It's a very tiny museum. Like to use the word museum is a little bit generous, but it's very, very spooky. Yes. All right, Diana, I think that settles that we're moving to Rome. Absolutely. It sounds like our place. Yeah. It's also a place that's obsessed with death. So I know you like ghosts. I don't know if you're obsessed with death also, but maybe they go hand in hand. I mean, we're not not obsessed with death, death right, Becky? Yeah. No, <laughs> Like vampires, I'm sure there's vampires. <laughs> we can take it or leave it. Yeah. <laughs> it's definitely worth an extended stay at the very least. So Katie, you also have a ghost story that you would like to share with us. I do. This is not Rome related. This actually happened in Seattle. And the reason I wanted to run it by you guys, because I've always been interested in what could be the smallest ghost story that would still qualify as a ghost story. And so this is my experience. I'm at a restaurant and I get up to go use the restroom. And this restaurant has just one of those one single restrooms where if it's locked, it says occupied. If it's unlocked, it says vacant. And you just stand in the hallway and wait your turn. I go to the hallway and I'm waiting my turn and it says occupied and it turns to vacant. I'm still waiting and whoever is in there doesn't come out. I figure it must be some woman who is now fixing her hair or I don't know, something is happening in there and I want her to hurry it along because I want to get back to the conversation I left. And so I decided I was going to just push on the door and do the, oh oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, move. (laughs) But when I opened the door, there wasn't anyone in there. And there wasn't even a window that would have been big enough for someone to go out of. And so I thought, what in the world? (laughs) Because I actually saw it turn from the red occupied to the green vacant. Right. And isn't that an odd decision that you would unlock the door before sneaking out the window? (laughs) Well, yeah, definitely a ghost. Yeah. 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 No other explanation. What a weird (laughs) thing, though. Like, what a weird thing to be doing as a ghost. (laughs) At the time, were you spooked or just confused? I think a little bit of both, because it's, I don't know if you go into ghostly experiences, like expecting something, but for me, I'm just waiting in a restaurant that's busy around me, and then this happens. I did find out after the fact that the owner of the restaurant had died the week prior. Yeah, exactly. But why she'd still want to be hanging around in the restroom, I don't know. Okay, well, here's another little bit of ghost lore for you. Bathrooms tend to be the most haunted places in a structure, (laughs) because again, water and mirrors uh, mirrors too Mm -hmm. a lot of people believe that mirrors can act as portals especially if there's two mirrors across from one another like you have in hair salons so you can see the back and the front a ghost might come in through one mirror portal and then get confused and not know which one to go back out of and so then they're just kind of stuck in your bathroom a lot of urban legends sort of follow along with this, like the idea of Bloody Mary, or there's the the Japanese demon that comes out of toilets and strangles schoolgirls or something with their hair. What is she called? The Japanese toilet monster. I thought she was just called the toilet monster or okay, something like yeah. that. Okay, yeah. And hey, Moaning Myrtle as well. Uh, moaning Myrtle, yeah. yes. Great example. There's a precedent for that. <laughs> when I was a kid, I was always told that my parents were weird. They would tell me that there was a toilet monster that would come up and grab my my bare butt if I sat too long in the toilet and pull me down into the septic tank to suffocate on fumes of all of my family's waste. (laughs) So unnecessarily (laughs) graphic (laughs) for children's parable. It'll keep you moving along, though. That is an interesting strategy. So this is a shared bathroom family lore. (laughs) We have one bathroom. Let's make the kids terrified of it. (laughs) But, But there is a lot of lore surrounding bathrooms and haunting. So I think maybe what, 60% of the stories we hear involve a haunted bathroom? It's bizarre Very amounts. common. Yeah. Mm. But also, if you think about it, the bathroom, this may be a strange way to phrase it, but the bathroom is specifically a place where you relax. Hmm. Right? Physically. So when you're physically relaxing, perhaps you're more susceptible to hauntings because you're more receptive. And you're mm. off guard. Mm-hmm. And also, public bathrooms specifically are considered liminal spaces in and of themselves because they are both public and private. Well, if you ever do get to Seattle, there is a very famous ghost around a bathroom in this old bar called Kells. And the basement is where the toilet is. 
And there's some ghost in period costume that's constantly like pushing past people in line down there, supposedly. Rude. <laughs> Very rude. <laughs> what are they in a rush for? <laughs> I feel like they, from what I remember, they just like to push in and out of the crowd. I don't even think they're heading anywhere necessarily. (laughs) This particular restaurant that you were in, it sounds like you think if it were a ghost, it may have been the owner that had passed away. Is this restaurant particularly old or is it an old part of town? It's a new restaurant that's hooked onto the courtyard of an older restaurant. They kind of share the space with one another. But no, it's not particularly old, nor in a very interesting part of town. It's a newer part of town. So maybe, do you think I just let her out? Was she just trapped in the bathroom? I mean, maybe. Do you think that? (laughs) I don't know. That's cool. Hey, you helped somebody. (laughs) Did you end up going into the bathroom after that? I did. Yeah. There was no other option. (laughs) <laughs> well, I mean, it was her turn. The ghost was done. That's true. Apparently so. <laughs> I'd be a little skeeved out to go in by myself after having yeah. that experience. I did do that thing where you come back to the table and you're like, so something interesting just happened. <laughs> but I feel like if I had a real ghost story, it'd be much more interesting. Katie, I, I think that qualifies as a real ghost story, small or not, unless there's some kind of magnetic device that could have been shifting that occupied vacant thing i mean that's really odd locks that's another thing we hear about is ghosts like locking and unlocking doors usually they're locking them usually they're being pests especially bathroom doors that have no windows but i think that the most important thing that makes a ghost story is your inability to explain what you witnessed and your acceptance that it might have been anything Mm-hmm. And that's one thing that we love about the stories that we collect is sometimes there is no explanation and we're fine with that. Mm-hmm. We we enjoy the wonder. We enjoy the curiosity and the speculation. And we enjoy that kind of uncomfortable space where you just don't know. It's because, kind of... yeah, was it a ghost? Was it a witch messing with you? <laughs> Unlocking the lock with telekinesis? Was it the government controlling locks from satellites i mean you could believe whatever you want yeah, maybe it was a time slip you just missed the three minutes where somebody actually walked out right exactly <laughs> you, you, <laughs> you go on forever on a, a temporary amnesia right there a little, little brief amnesia into you a know. parallel universe yeah. exactly <laughs> think, yeah so, that's that's the important that's what makes something a ghost story i think is the wonder behind it yeah i like that explanation the best that i just lost time for a second there <laughs> really just some average guy came out <laughs> The people next to you were like, why is that woman just standing there? (laughs) Doesn't she see that the other woman came out of the restroom? What's she doing? Why is she drooling? Her eyes are glazed over. She looks like she's slumped against the wall. Oh, she's fine again. Yeah, Yeah, and then that guy goes to his table and he says, so the weird thing just happened. (laughs) (laughs) And the cycle of being a confused and wondrous human repeats. (laughs) Tiffany doesn't have a ghost story to share, but she has one of the creepiest in real life stories that I know. Yes, you're right, Katie. So when I was in high school, my bedroom was on the ground floor of our house. It was the suburbs, but it was very green, leafy, foresty type area. It's the kind of place where somebody could potentially be prowling around. I had the curtains down And then for some reason, I decided to open them, and it was nighttime. I opened the curtains, and I saw this little smudge on the glass that just looked weird. And so I went, and it was a a really, really large, wide window, and I went up really close to it. It was like a print on glass, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know what a handprint looks like, except it was the print of somebody's ear, and the short hairs right where a sort of a sideburn would be, and like maybe a jaw. And it slowly came into focus for me. And I was like, you know, that moment of initial fear when you're just like kind of not believing it and not sure what's going on. And then all of a sudden I saw another one and another one and another, and they were all over the windows, like all in different places, all over the windows. And it was always the same. You could tell it was the ear of the same man over and over and over again. I was at home with my mom. She was dating someone at the time, so she called him up and said, you've got to come over and spend the night with us because this scary thing happened. 
We even called the police, and they didn't find anything. Like, they didn't find any footprints. They didn't find any proof of anything. That's oh, terrifying. That's creepy. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. But there were no footprints, no disturbances in the grass. And you said it slowly came into focus. Do you mean it was fresh? It was very fresh. Oh, yeah. I think it had happened maybe, like, earlier that day. But the implication being, right, that if it's covered in that, that he's there every night. Well, no, because I saw it one time. I would have seen it. Yeah. No, no, no. I would have seen it if it had been there for more than a few hours or a day. It was not something that you could miss. Like, I missed it because I had the curtains down. And so I wasn't seeing it at all because the curtains were down. Once I saw it, I mean, it was it was unmistakable. And I don't think that I could have not noticed that for days at a time. That is so weird. So some creepy guy just like came up and put his ear all over your window. Well, now I'm hoping it's a ghost. There weren't any footprints. It could have been. Yeah, so. I guess that is reassuring that there were no footprints. There were no disturbances. I mean, he, there would be something, especially if he was there long enough to have put his ear against the window for that long. You'd think there would at least be crushed grass under the window or some mud or I mean, something. You can tell when somebody's been standing somewhere. Yeah, you're right. And if he was covering his tracks, why didn't he clean the window? Yeah, true. So, yeah, could have been a ghost. For the purposes of this show, we'll say it is a ghost. Yes, finally. Plus, that makes it somehow less scary in this case. It kind of does. Exactly. <laughs> Tiffany and Katie, this has been so delightful to talk to you and hear some Roman folklore and Katie, your spooky bathroom story and Tiffany, your spooky ear story. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for having us. I forgot to mention that Katie is actually one of our patrons. That's right. That's right. All of you who listening who are not yet subscribed to their Patreon channel, you should get on that. I think it's imperative to support the podcasters that you really love. Thank you, Katie. And thanks Thank again you. for being our patron. Thank you so much. This has been so much fun to talk to you. You've been listening to Katie and Tiffany of the Bittersweet Life podcast. Tell people where they can find your podcast. I know you're available on major podcasting platforms, but do you have a URL that you'd like to share with people and some social handles? Yes, we do. We're at the bittersweetlife.net where we have a huge catalog of past episodes because we've been on the air for almost 10 years now. But you'll find different categories at thebittersweetlife.net. So if you have like specific interests, you can browse around and jump around that way. And we're also on social media. Yes, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The handles are slightly different. So just search for The Bittersweet Life Podcast and you will find us. Excellent. And while you're following the Bittersweet Life podcast, we would love it if you would follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Homespun Haints. And also our show notes are at homespunhaints.com, where we will include links to the Bittersweet Life podcast, their social handles, bios about Katie and Tiffany. They have very interesting bios as well. They didn't talk about this, but Katie, you used to work for NPR, correct? Yeah, still do, although not as a full-time job right now, just out of choice. But yes, I worked for NPR for over a decade full-time and with them in total probably now about t almost 20 years. And Tiffany, you have another job outside of podcasting? I am a writer. I have a book out called Midnight in the Piazza, which is a middle grade art mystery. And you can find that pretty much Amazon anywhere. And I'm also a tour guide and I do tours of Rome. Yes. And we do lots of tours of Rome on the show on the Bittersweet Life as well. We, one of my favorite episodes we did during the pandemic was me and Tiffany pretending to go on a walking tour of Rome with her guiding us around and me using sound effects from the actual locations to make it sound like we were there. Right around the time when everyone is going a little stir crazy. That is awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you both so much. This has been wonderful. It's so much fun to finally be on. I love your show. Aw, thank you so Yay. much. <laughs> be sure to check out the Bittersweet Life podcast. But in the meantime, if you do find yourself wandering the streets of Rome, cradling your head in your hands like a football, that you've just won the World Cup with, you're definitely going to have a spooky day. Homespun Haints is hosted by Becky Kielimnik and Diana Doty and produced by Homespun Haints Media, LLC. Editing and music by Becky Kielimnik. Show notes by Diana Doty. 
If you have a ghost story and you'd like to be considered as a guest for this podcast, please visit our website at homespunhates.com slash submit.